honor and privilege to be here uh, with this esteemed panel. Uh, we'll start with introductions, uh, right to left, uh, and uh, that's Energizer Bunny, Nipun Mehta, founder of Service Space. <laughs> Please welcome him. Uh, Mary Ellen Loyens, uh, Chief Business Development and Brand Officer, Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Fabulous, fabulous to have you here. Uh, and of course, to your extreme left, my left, your right, uh, Dr. Geeta Murli. Uh, she's Chief Development Officer, Room to Read. Please welcome the panelists. While we have a very small group, I am very proud that you all made it here. You made good planning decisions because you got here before the soccer crazy fans got there, so you got parking. And then you chose to be in this room other than you know rubbing shoulders with other tech gurus. So two good decisions that you already made. Uh, let's see your giving back, giving back thoughts. Uh, just by a raise of hands, uh, how many have given locally in your city other than schools and your alma mater? Raise of hands. Thank you. Uh, how many have given in India or worldwide? More hands. Now I didn't say have you given money, did I? How many have given your time, be it here or in India? That's just about all of you, which makes their job harder to inspire you to give more and to give back. <laughs> Now let's pretend I'm actually an IITN. I get my first job in this country, I come here, I get a good paycheck, and then somebody asks me to give back. And I'm thinking, I have to send money back home, I have a sibling who needs to get married, I want to get married so I want to save for that, so why should I give back? Would you like to start? We, we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it flexible so that uh, you know I don't want it to be too structured. Let's keep it flexible. Anyone who wants to take that, why should I give back? So unity is part of the uh, solution. Anybody else want to jump in? Mary? Well said. Well. Very well said. <laughs> if you could bring Anything the microphone yes. closer to your mouth. She's great. <laughs> Hard act to follow, but we know you'll do well. Why should they give, and especially with the background of Silicon Valley Community Foundation, you are basically our bankers. I think the truth is that we all benefit from philanthropy. There's another session at this conference today that talks about how expensive poverty is. It's actually more expensive to let our community suffer than it is for each of us to take some small act of kindness. I love your pay it forward campaign. And I think there's some truth to that. Each of us, no matter how wealthy we are, benefit from overall philanthropy from the small acts of kindness that others have done. Either we personally did at one point or some member of our family will. We're all one community. So if you want your community uh, to be a better place for you, for your family, for your grandparents, for your children, that's why you should give back. You're larger than your nuclear family. I like that. Thank you. Uh, Nipun? And for me, uh, it's on, yeah. 
for me, I give for the spirit of inner transformation. I find that whenever I give, there, my mind quiets down. And in that quiet, I, I drop into a deeper interconnection with other life. And it becomes very natural and spontaneous to give. So I, I think there's a sort of inside out approach to giving. On the outside, it feels, I started out by trying to help. And I think there's a lot of compassion in wanting to help because you see others suffering. But on the receiving end, you, it's like when you help, you see life as weak. When you fix and you say, well, I've got this fancy degree and I want to go out and these kids in the slums don't have a house and I have an architect, I'm going to fix it for them. And I think there's a sense of personal mastery to that. But when you fix, you see life as broken if you're on the other side. So when you serve with this idea that I may be giving you this, but in return I'm getting something else in a different form of capital, uh, then I think it changes the whole game. And I think it creates a very uh, different uh, symbiotic, uh, pri the symbiotic relationship where the sum of the parts is greater than just two. So I, I think that inside out approach of giving has really what has lighted my way. You've gone into soulful meditation, but I like the way you're going. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, uh, I'll start with Gita in this case. Uh, Gita, a couple of years ago, uh, Rotary's uh, youth organization, Interact, uh, raised more than $100,000 for Room to Read uh, for a project in Bangladesh. Uh, which brings me to a question. Uh, when is the right time to give? Like, does your bank balance reach a particular amount, and then it's, there's a ringtone that says, money, 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 time to give back? You know, I think from from my perspective, even closer, be right on top of it. Yeah. Uh, sorry about um, that. I, I think definitely, I don't come from the perspective that that you need to have a certain bank balance to be able to give. I think it's something that we can instill in our children at very young ages in terms of the kindness they show to others in their local community but also in terms of their global outlook. If you look at the way Room to Read operates, we definitely work with our investors in a way that, and when I say investors, even the youngest children who are in the first grade doing book drives, all the way through to our chapters and volunteers who are sort of many times new in their careers, to our board members globally who are very senior in their careers, to, to our legacy givers, that any time during your lifetime, the right cause, the right mission that drives you to make an impact in the world can be a part of your life in whatever way you can give back, be that time, be that money, be that skills. Because ultimately organizations like ours are operating and trying to operate like businesses with the right integrity, the ability to scale, but are restricted by the overhead ratio. You know, all of you are looking at, at how much are they spending on their administration and how much is going to programs. But ultimately, we're trying to solve some of the world's largest challenges. And for that, one needs resources of all kinds of, of different forms. And so I don't think it's about the age. I think it's about building the global movement, building the outrage and the commitment to, to make a change in the world. Thank you. And how do you encourage someone to start really young, Mary Ellen? Um, for us? OK. Oh, uh, go ahead. No, that's fine. Sorry, I <laughs> Well, I, I think if you're not thinking about your children and how to give back from as soon as they understand things, you're too late. Uh, the culture that you give your children is from the day that they're born. How you're going to read to them, how you're going to treat them, and how you treat them is teaching them how to treat others. So as soon as they are able to understand helping others, I hope that you are teaching them that whether it be going outside and picking up trash from the sidewalk or making a gift of some sort. Maybe you go to the zoo and you show them, oh, you know, we can make a dollar donation to the zoo and it's going to help it. It doesn't need to be a lot of money. It's about instilling a culture of being part of community and being a good, caring citizen from the beginning. That's very nicely said. When my daughter used to get a new backpack back to school, I would tell her, whatever you buy, you need to fill another backpack, and you go and give it to another child. And it, it wasn't, it, I mean, monetarily speaking, it was a very small amount. But that, what got, that got her to do was every time there was a back to school drive, she would remember that and go for it, irrespective of which neighborhood it's in. Thank you so much for that. Nipun, would you like to um, say something? I, I think one of the big insights, I'm looking at this guy, Sridhar, uh, right there. He has done something remarkable with his friend Feroz at SAP. Um, they decided that they were going to hire, Feroz had an autistic child, and he realized 
He says, you know, who's going to take care of my son when I'm gone? And he realized that I actually want to incorporate them into the company. So he hired five autistic people after looking at their strengths. Wow. And it became such a powerful example that the CEO of SAP says, by, uh, 20, by 2020, we're going to have 1% of our staff be on the autism spectrum. And Ban Ki-moon at the UN says, this is so amazing, we should get everyone else to do that. And if you ask him, well, what was the core insight? And he says the core insight was that everybody is good at something, that you just have to figure out what they're good at. And I think this applies even to our own journeys of generosity, because we say, well, I don't have this. This is how this guy was able to give. But I think the question is, can we change our lens and say, well, what is it that I do have? And how can I, you know, what am I good at? And how can I offer that good to the world, not just keep it for myself or not just monetize it? And in some cases, it may not even be monetizable, but still we can offer it to the world. It's another example of corporate social responsibility in a very different way. Yeah. And I just heard today, I hope this news is true because it came you know, one of those tweets uh, that Flipkart is giving back uh, to families that adopt. And I, I said, you know, that really helps remove the stigma, especially in countries like India. Uh, I, I think that's amazing. So thank you for that. Uh, I just want to remind our audience members, if you have the uh, app, you could send questions, and it'll either come up there, Amit, it'll either come up there, or, it'll, or it might come up on my phone. So we are saving a lot of time for Q&A. So please start doing that as you think of it. Um, so everybody in the Valley knows that there are many, many NGOs, and they all demand our attention. Uh, Mary Ellenson, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, kind of has the Rolodex of all the uh, NGOs. Um, how do you help craft a, a vision for philanthropic giving and receiving? Because you are at both ends. Uh, I would like to start with you. I think uh, we try to work with people in developing a strategic giving statement, a vision statement about your mission of philanthropy. I think what's different about a person than a company is that SAP's mission statement, for example, is not going to change a great deal in 20 years. What that company is trying to achieve is set. But as individuals, our lives will evolve. We'll be introduced to new challenges that didn't exist previously. So part of what we're doing with Philanthropist is saying, OK, where are you now? Let's create the strategy now. But then it's OK to revisit that every few years and say, well, where are we today? Well, when I first did this, my children were four. But now my children are 12. And now they can really engage. Or now they're going to Bellarmine. And Bellarmine says they should be going out and doing philanthropy. So how am I helping them understand thinking about that more thoughtfully? So I think for an individual, it's a little different than a company. We mm -hmm. should constantly think about evolving because Frankly, the things we care about evolve. I mean, many of the philanthropists we work with are in India, go back and forth to India, and just the towns that they support have evolved enormously. And so what was the pressing need when they first came to America and started working here at Cisco, and what's the pressing need today, is really different. So I think part of what we need to do as philanthropists, especially when we're engaged in communities that are going through massive change, is be comfortable with having strategies today, but also being willing to reassess those strategies as our communities evolve. Thank you. That's very well said. Who would like to follow up on that? Gita, would you like to go? So I think the question from, from our perspective is a little bit different. Right, so, so how do we work with, with our investors to sort of craft the way mm -hmm. we engage with Rintree? So I think for us, it, it is truly about understanding what motivates an individual at any given time in their life to work with a cause. You know, what is it that, that they're trying to achieve through their own giving? Um, are they looking to have their children involved and to learn more about the world in different ways? Are they looking to have measurable impact in particular communities. And we do go through quite a lot um, of effort to understand you know, our investors as well as help them understand the challenges that we're trying to solve and why we work the way that we do. And I think it's incredibly important when we think about giving and, and why we give and who we give to, to ensure that, that we're more and more responsible um, about what we do with our time, with our resources, 
to ensure that the organizations that we're giving to are in fact having the impact that we want to have in the world. And I think that there was a time that it was easy when someone asked, just write a, a quick check and be done with it. And, and I think you know some people can continue to do that and that's, that's great for the charity to receive those funds. But I think the most valued investors for organizations like ours are ones that really want to travel the journey and solve the challenge with us. And, and I think that in doing that, they're getting their time, they're getting their networks, um, they're owning our challenges, they're understanding why it's logistically challenging to get books um, to the char in Bangladesh, you know, when there's floods. I mean, they're understanding those issues so that when we come back to them and explain what we're trying to do next, they want to stay with us because this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, the challenges that we're dealing with. And, and we definitely want our investors to, to travel the road with us. And if there are any VCs or angel investors in this room, you don't have to raise your hand, but speak to her later. <laughs> uh, Nipun, I can only aspire to be uh, you know, what you've done with your life. Uh, you've given all of yourself. So a little different from the question that I asked them, how can people give more of themselves while holding? They can't, can't all do what you did. How do they still hold their job and still give? And what are the unique ways to give other than reaching into your wallet? Um. I think there's lots of ways. Uh, Rumi said there, you know, like, what did he say? A million ways to kneel and kiss the ground, um, and I think that's true of giving. Too. I mean, there's just a million ways to give. Uh, there's seven billion ways to give. Um, one of the things I think that we can push ourselves in is, is innovating in this field, and some of that innovation looks very different. For example, on Wikipedia, we've all heard of Wikipedia. There have been 100 million volunteer hours that have been donated on Wikipedia through those micro edits. And experts say that's only 1% of the pie. So there's 99% of this surplus that hasn't been tapped into. And this was all created in the last decade because prior mm -hmm. to the internet, we didn't have access to mm -hmm. that. And I we know that. that every week uh, globally, people play 3 billion hours of video games. They're not getting paid for this. This is three billion hours. Right? So can we find, can we push ourselves to find a stronger narrative, uh, a stronger platform, stronger ways to engage this energy to solve problems of suffering in the world? Uh, and I think that's a, that's a new possibility that didn't exist more than a decade ago. So we're just learning that this potential is even there. Uh, and how do we engage with that? So I don't think it's about quitting and leaving everything. Mm -hmm. That may be your calling for and you some. do it. But I think even if you can give an hour a month, everyone can give an hour a month, right? And I mean, even, does, even if you're homeless, you can contribute. I know homeless people who have nothing and they contribute. So how can, you, how can we create avenues for that deepening of engagement going from even a minute? And so how do you find those? Uh, Marian, uh, answer, go ahead and then I'll ask the follow-up question. If I, if I might just ask. Please do. I, I look at the audience and the question you asked earlier, you know, who's giving in some way or another with your time or energy and most of you raised your hand. So we're sort of preaching to the choir. But I have an appeal for you specifically. And when I look in the audience, I see Gear Shaw, who is one of the most philanthropic people I know. He raised very philanthropic children. They do wonderful volunteerism and personal philanthropy. He doesn't need a lecture from me to give. What Girish needs from me is a reminder. Be an evangelist. That's your most powerful role at this point. Get others to do what you have already done. Get others to give, get others to volunteer, get others to raise children who will make our world a better place. That is such an important role, and your work is not done when you volunteer alone or when you give alone. Your work must extend to helping others understand how important it is. Thank you so much. In so talking about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, we'll say Girish started a moment. I would love to say that. Uh, it's true, we need more people like you. Very well said. Uh, Gita? Well, I mean, I think the, the comparisons that are being made are so important for us to really think about the, the notion that we can do so much with so little. And when I think about you know, some of the statistics out there, I was reading somewhere that they, they were saying that it would take $28 billion to solve all of the world's education, health care, and sanitation issues. But we spend $59 billion on ice cream globally every year. And in my mind, I, I was thinking, wow, you know, how much could we do? And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that theme of the collective. 
how much could we do for this world if each person did their part? And I think going back to, to what you were saying, the, the idea that it's not just the people in this room, but it's, it's our networks and it's reaching out and making sure others get involved. Uh, and if we're going to read our movement of chapters, we've got about 15,000 um, volunteers across 40 cities that do quite a lot of work for us. They raise about 30% of what we raise every year doing their day jobs during the day and, and supporting our efforts around the world. And I recognize that none of these organizations can do the good work that, that they do around the world without huge movements of people um, that are supporting their efforts and believing in, in their goals. And so for all of you that do that, thank you. Continue to do so. Um, but definitely make sure that you know every day, whatever place you sit within your company, within your family, that, that you do feel very empowered to tell others to do what you do. Thank you. At this point, I just want to remind again, uh, I'm not sure, Amit, if this is working because I don't see any questions. You do? Okay, so it's not showing up on mine yet. Uh, just give me a moment. I can work, I can work from that. Okay. Um, so I, I just had one question. And how, how are we doing on time? Oh, thank you. I have a question about your children. How many of your children are in middle school? Raise of hands. High school? So quite a few. And grandchildren, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Your family is unique. Your family is unique. I've met your son and daughter. It's absolutely spectacular. I'm sure it runs in the blood. It's in the DNA. So when you go to drop your child to any of these uh, service events, do you stay back and see what it is? So I would like you to think of that when you ask some of the questions. Do you stay back at that event to see what exactly are they doing? If it is a food pantry, do you wait to see what they are doing? That will really help our panelists answer some of your questions, because we want to see what you are thinking other than giving your time and money. What else are you thinking about? And, and Nipun, I really want you to uh, address this one specific question. You've traveled the world. You, um, You've seen need in India. You've seen need here. Is there a difference in the two, or is it all the same? Is it vanilla? You know, I was recently having a conversation with a woman who's one of the world's leading fundraisers, Lynn Twist. She was with Mother Teresa, and at one point, some rich donor comes in and says, "I want a photo," and uh, they, Mother Teresa is like, "Sure." So they have this photo. And he said, no, no, Mother Teresa, not there, move here. So they wanted her centered in the photo. It's like, okay. And they're like, no, 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 Mother Teresa, move your chin up. And he started moving her face around so he could get the perfect shot. And Mother Teresa, I mean, Lynn Twist, looks at this. She, of course, had a lot of respect for Mother Teresa. And he's like, you guys got to be kidding me. You're moving Mother Teresa's face around to get a photo. This is even pre-selfies, right? So it was, it, she was outraged. She goes up to Mother Teresa after they leave, and she says, "What? What you? You know, like what's going on? Like I, I just, I can't control my rage." And Mother Teresa, very calm and very compassionately, says, "Dear, there's so many different kinds of poverty. That that person had a certain kind of capital, <laughs> but clearly poor in so many other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Poverty of the soul." <laughs> And, uh, and I, I don't know if we can address that here. <laughs> what was that? I don't know if we can address that. Well, I think we have to face that. You know, I, I think it's a very real issue. So to really look at, you know, look, look at everything and say, well, there are some needs here, but there's also some kind of wealth. So yes, of course, everything doesn't look like vanilla, but all flavors are ultimately flavors of suffering, right? And so how do we look at the problems with the lens of co-creation rather than like this top down I have and you first need to suffer like me. The mm -hmm. UN actually says, you know, there's this Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. which is baked into all philanthropy and we know that it doesn't actually work. But so you had, like it used to be that first you go from lower class to middle class, so you suffer like me and then maybe we'll get to self-actualization. But now they're saying that that hasn't worked with trillions of dollars in so many different places around the world with so much science uh, behind it. They're saying it's more like vitamins. And vitamins mm -hmm. is you don't finish vitamin C by the age of three and then get to vitamin D. You need mm -hmm. all of them together at all times. And so this idea of really pushing ourselves to say, 
Well, there is suffering in Asia, they're suffering on the streets, they're suffering in the corporate boardrooms, they're suffering everywhere. Um, and there's also assets everywhere. And how can we bring all those things creatively together in a way that we're all collectively better off? And uh, I think that's the challenge and the opportunity. We'd love to see a happier world, I totally agree. Um, Mariel and Orgita, would you like to say some ways of how we can actually get about doing that? I'd like to answer one sure. of the questions on the board, if that's okay. And the, the bottom one is how to find a very specific problem which needs solution in our society. And it makes me think of one of my favorite nonprofits or NGOs in India called I Pay to Bribe. Who's familiar with I Pay to Bribe? Yeah. What a wonderful idea. So some very smart person said, there's a real problem in India with bribery. And how are we going to address this issue societally? So they created a place, a website, a Twitter feed, where people could report when they paid a bribe. So that then they would have data where people were anonymously protected to help actually change some of those areas. I think picking a nonprofit comes from something personal like that. I think that person had to pay a bribe at some point. The founder clearly had to pay a bribe or many bribes and said, this is just wrong. I mean, I can afford to pay about this bribe, but what about the next person who cannot? And I think that's where you pick a specific need. You find something that touches you personally because when you have passion around something, you are bound to take it farther. It's just like, when you were at school and they were teaching you about engineering and teaching you which part of engineering you should go to, they were trying to tap into your passion. Philanthropy is the same thing. Pick something you deeply care about because that is the thing that you will change the world around. And I heard the same thing at this morning's keynote. You just have to pick something that you truly, truly care about and, and give up everything for it. You have to put your heart and soul into it. So I think we'll go to the, we have about 10 minutes, so I'd love to go to the questions there. Uh, anyone can take this. Can you summarize a few quick points to inspire friends and associates? It's from the audience. Who would like to go? I, I think that it actually just to jump um, from what Mary Ellen was just talking about, the idea of finding your cause is incredibly important and believing in something is sort of the, the key to, to what inspires you. If I look at myself, um, we were talking a little bit about what can people give up and, and all of those different things. Um, I was a statistician. I thought my life's work was done when I came out of graduate school. I was gonna be working in for-profit. I was making good money, I was 22 years old and realized that wasn't what was going to inspire me. I needed to find something I was more passionate about than submitting you know, clinical trial data to the FDA. And for some people, clinical trial data to the FDA is what inspires them, and they would do that job well, but that wasn't going to be me. And so I realized that, and I think finding you know, your calling comes from finding what does inspire you. And for me, spending time in India, seeing children who could do so much more with their lives if they had just a little bit of extra resource invested in them was what inspired me. That drove me to adopt my daughter, that drove me to change my career and be a part of Room to Read. Um, and it made me believe that something else was possible. And so I think if I had to say, you know, what should I say to my associates to inspire them? Find what it is that really makes you feel excited about doing the work that you're going to be doing, either if not in your job, then with the cause that you're working with. But I truly believe that world change starts with educated children, and that's what Room to Read stands for, and that's the organization I've chosen to give my life's work to. So I would say, you know, similarly, you know, find those things that really make you excited to do the work you do, be it in your day job or in your volunteer activities. And when you sleep at night, count your brawny pounds of satisfaction, what you did today. Uh, anybody else? Or I can go to the next question. Um, I, I would say, I, I'll share a story around that first question. What are your thoughts on teaching someone? Uh, or, no, that's a new that's question. That's the next one. It's the next one. Uh, <laughs> but the the previous one was, can you summarize? To inspire. I, I, I think the best way, Gandhi had it right when he said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Um, there was a woman who worked uh, down the street at Cisco, and she was asking the question, how can I get all my colleagues to do acts of kindness and, and be a little bit gentler and you know kinder? So, of course, there's this view, how, how can I change other people? And then at some point, she's like, let me just be the change. 
let me do something myself. She decides to go to the Coke can machine, I guess at that time it was 50 cents, she puts the 50 cents in, and she puts a little smile card there. It says, you don't know who did this act of kindness, but your next drink is on me, and just pay it for or do something kind for someone else. And so she just does this very simple thing, but all of a sudden, like, someone gets it, and then they're like totally wowed by it, and then the next day she would do another 50 cents, and every day she would do one of these things, and at some point someone emails a whole building, says, Oh my God, if someone is doing this every single day. I haven't caught them, will you help me catch them? You know, so instead of a cr neighborhood crime watch, it was a neighborhood <laughs> kindness watch. You know, everyone's like on the lookout. And she started to move on to donuts on another floor, you know. Uh, and I think there's this viral, they studied at uh, Max Planck uh, Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology, they studied 18 month olds. And these 18 month olds look at a stranger and the stranger is just putting on clothes with a clothespin. All of a sudden they drop one of the clothespins. And immediately, the 18-month-old, who has had no instruction on compassion or kindness, goes in, picks this up, and gives it to them. So we don't need to teach anyone kindness or compassion. We're already kind and compassionate. We just need to open up that possibility that, hey, even at Cisco it happens, even every, you know, wherever you're planted, we can all be like that. So I think you just have to trust nature to kind of take it. In that direction. And giving it forward is, is one way to do it. And yeah. the ice cream is a great example. So maybe there'll be someone who says, if you buy an ice cream, I'll give one for free. And you know, that, that'll get something going. Um, I think we have time for the previous question, though it's just off the screen. It was about how you uh, teach the fish one. Yeah. 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 Can someone scroll down so we can see the fish <laughs> one again? Oh. Yeah. How did yeah, I, I'd like to talk about this one because I get this a lot, uh, and it surprises me actually. Uh, should we teach a man to fish rather than give him a fish? Um, if you walk a along a street and you see a, a poor starving beggar begging for food, do you say, let me give you a full ride scholarship to IIT <laughs> and all your problems will be solved? It's true. A Fulbright scholarship would certainly help his problems, but he will starve to death before he graduates. It's not an if or but. It's a both. We have to do both. We have to lift people up until they can fish. I don't just walk up to you and say, go fishing. I have to give you a fishing rod or a net. I have to give you bait. <laughs> All the worse. <laughs> Right? <laughs> you know? Uh, so what's your excuse for starving? Go out and eat a plant. You know? Uh, but it's, it, it, it can't, if we go about things saying, I demand that you take care of yourself, without giving you the tools to take care of yourself, we're making a big mistake. We have to give people the tools to take care of themselves first. Because if I tell a vegan in the desert, oh, we'll just pick a plant, you're in the desert. You know, what are you gonna eat? I have to give you the garden. I have to give you the opportunity to feed yourself. So I think that's one of the things that really always uh, sort of doesn't feel right about this question to me is that it, it supposes it should be one or the other. And I believe we must do both. We cannot let the beggar starve while we give him the opportunity to make his own food. Thank you. And I think we've addressed the other two questions. I would like to see the last question. Can that be scrolled up? Um, it would be great to have one website which says, if you have an hour and a dollar, what to do? And that is probably the last question that we'll take. And your work for the I'll, I'll try and if I have a minute for a yeah, lightning round after this. So anybody wants to take that, it would be great to have one website which says if you have an hour and a dollar, what to do. There's like 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no shortage of websites, and it depends on what country you're in, which website I would recommend to you, um, or even what community you're in. Um, but I think uh, the bottom line is that if you just blindly give a dollar and an hour to something that popped up on a search engine, it will not be fulfilling to you. I think it has to start with some passion. You know, have you ever read to your children? Have you ever thought about what if someone else couldn't afford to give their children books? That's a great moment, a great inspiration to think about an organization like Room to Read. So I think 
Um, you know, there are as many options as walking into Costco in philanthropy. Yeah, you can go to Costco and you can buy like everything, but will you come out of Costco with a cart full of 16 rolls of toilet paper and wonder how that happened <laughs> and not feel good about it? You know, the, philanthropy can be the same way. You don't want to wheel out of that big box store and not feel good about the change you've made. So I would say, yeah, there could be, and there are many out there. There's GuideStar, GuideStar India, the, you know, Charity a, Navigator, Charity Navigator. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, Volunteer Match, many, Board many Match, websites. many, many, Human many yeah. Thieba websites. But um, in the end, I encourage you to look for your own inspiration, and there's inspiration around you every day. Thank you. And now I want to move to a lightning round that will be for the panelists, and they have to think quickly and answer this very quickly. What would one advice? Let's start with Nipun this time. What advice would you give your 21-year-old self about giving? I would say be the change you wish to see in the world. Gandhi didn't say create the change. Gandhi didn't say preach about the change like we're all doing. Gandhi didn't say you know um, so many other things that you could do, but he said be the change. I think when you change from within, you change on the outside. Mary Ellen. I'd say chill out. I was volunteering for the children's brain tumor walkathon. I was so depressed that the world was falling apart and it wouldn't be a good place and where will I start? And it was just too stressful and it gave me a step back. So I would say chill out, you're 21. You can't change the world today. You're not Mozart, but you know, do a little bit, feel good about a little bit. I'd probably say push the envelope because I think back to you know when I was 21 and the way people were giving was there was only really one way you wrote a check or you know maybe you did some volunteering and that was about it you know um, now I mean the the sky's the limit I mean we have video games that are giving us you know funding um, based on the number of signups we have um, people who are you know younger children doing book drives we have um, you know a number of different companies Republic of tea giving us you know child money off their tea lines for children I mean the number of different ways people have come up with to do good work I mean through the skills that they have creating the right technologies I was hearing about the glasses that you can just buy one pair of glasses for your entire lifetime and just change the power in them I mean there's so many different ways that with your own skill set and your own sort of aptitude towards the world that that you can give back so I would just say you know think outside the box and you'll probably come up with something that's even just a little bit different and best for you and I, I, I told my 21 year old that I would have told her to take more risks and help someone cross a road, even if it's tough, and give all your pocket money away. I mean, that's what I would have told her, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, and one last question to all of you. What would you like on your epitaph? What would you like it to read? Go ahead. She made the world a better place. Great. Gita? You know, I don't know that I would want an epitaph. <laughs> Google's going to solve death and we're all going to live forever. It's, just, it's an algorithm. She'll live forever. Know, I, I think, I, no, I think, I think that I'm, I'm happy where I am. I think the time is now. You do what you can while you're here. And, and hopefully you've left you know, a little bit of yourself with, with a few people to take, to take the work forward. That's a living legacy. Great. Thank you. You're I'd probably say um, there lies a man who tried to be recklessly generous. Okay, <laughs> uh, I would like to venture some uncharted territories, and that's what I would like. Uh, she ventured uncharted territories. Uh, so I think we are about to wrap up. Uh, the tagline for this conference was "Gain," which is give back, achieve, innovate, and inspire, just in case you didn't see that. So I really hope that this panel has helped you, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm fully inspired by them, but I wrote this down earlier today. They inspired you in innovative ways to give back or give forward to help others achieve their dream. So that's gain for you. I hope you've all gained something here today. Thank you very much for being here.